Good morning, Revolution, and welcome, Facebook friends and YouTube comrades, Facebook comrades too, as brothers and sisters. Hope everybody's doing good. Scott's back. Welcome back, Scott. I'm back. I must have overslept. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome back, Carter. Remains <laughs> that old TV show. Glad you're you're here. Some of your fans missed you. Good morning, Rosanna. Good morning. Good morning, Revolution. And Michael. Morning, Morning Revolution. Revolution. There you go. Yeah, put some amp in your step. Some um, something in your stride. I was trying to think of something that rhymes with it. Well, <laughs> last night the president, bless his heart, gave a big speech, and he said mass mandates, a hundred million workers. Uh, if you don't, I mean, federal government, all y'all got to get. Uh, 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 vaccinated, no exception. Contractors, anybody who's receiving federal money, uh, post office, uh, health centers, dialysis centers, you name it, is going to, I think, affect 75% of the workforce, Rosanna. Good thing or bad? I think it's a good thing. I mean, uh, if they don't they want to do it, you know, if people don't want to get vaccinated on their own, understanding that they're, they're making this worse and, and prolonging this virus because it keeps mutating because many, many people aren't uh, vaccinated. Uh, so I think that that's, it's a necessary thing, unfortunately. I don't really and like the school it. School board in I LA. Mean, it's necessary. What's that? The school board in LA. Man mandate all students over 12. How are the people in LA responding to that? Uh, well, you know, the news always uh, tries to cover up, but the reality, I think, uh, but the reality is a lot of parents are very, very much for it. Um, they, they're happy that their <clears throat> uh, students have to wear masks and that their younger children are going to be protected as well. Those that are 11 and under, they're gonna also be protected by this mandate. So it's, it's important. We can't play around with it anymore. I mean, Florida, we had 15 teachers come down with it and I believe it was 11 to 13 of them died from it. Whoa, terrible. So it's terrible. nothing, you know, you can't, you can't deny it. And if you're continually denying it, then you're not looking, you're not living in the real world. 40% mm -hmm. well, of the population ain't living in the real world, unfortunately. <laughs> Anita, when I was coming up, mumps, vaccination, chicken mm -hmm. pox, vaccination, you go to school. That's huh? right. You had to have your, your vaccination card to do a lot of things. Uh, I know I raised two boys and I had to keep their vaccination cards in a special place so I could prove their uh, status. And I think you could even go farther than, uh, uh, the, than the president went last night and maybe say vaccination requirement for, for anybody getting on an airplane or getting on a, a train. Uh, so I think traveling around, I think, but I, I, I think it's a really good start in 75% of the uh, workforce, that sounds like a, a good start. And I'm sure people are gonna protest and uh, maybe uh, get their own little private schools going like they have, I think, in Florida where um, vaccinations are not required and masks are not required, but that's uh, going to be pro proved to be uh, really detrimental to kids' health and to parents and, and teachers as well and grandparents, the whole family, the whole community is affected. So, but Scott, isn't this an indication of encroaching dictatorship, authoritarianism? Shouldn't this be a choice between you and your doctor? Well, um, I'm going to say yes, but probably not in the way you mean the question. Uh, I think what's at stake here, you know, the, these anti-mask, anti-vaccine people are always talking about their freedom, our freedom, freedom to do what I want with my body, right? There are, but we live in a class society. There are two different conceptions of freedom. On the one hand, you have the billionaire conception of freedom, which is the freedom to do whatever you want and then to escape the consequences. You know, think of Bezos or, or Elon Musk, you know, um, polluting whatever, then, you know, building a, a rocket and, and exploring the stars, right? Freedom to do what you want and escape the consequences. That's not working class freedom. 
That's tyranny for the working class. The working class conception of freedom is collective, right? We work together to protect ourselves from the, the power of that, that billionaire elite. So I think what's happening here with these masks is that there's a section of the working class that has taken up the, the, the ruling class, the capitalist conception of freedom, uh, right? And you know they perceive as dictatorship anything that uh, forces them to work collectively with, with other people. And that's, um, there's an ideological struggle there that has to be waged, obviously. But how does that compare to the issue of choice, Scott? I mean, they're, they're, they're for choice when it comes to vaccines, but they're against choice when it comes to a woman's right to choose. Well, they're for their own hypocrisy. choice. They're for uh, their own choice and they're against other people's choice, I think is what it uh -huh. comes down to. Um, you know, uh, so they, they um, in a lot of these cases, they don't even think other people should be allowed to wear masks, right? Their people have been, you know, uh, victims of aggression just for wearing masks in, in stores and places. So it's, you know, the usual conservative kind of, I guess, hypocrisy, if, if that's what you want to call it, um, of, uh, you know, thinking that their freedom, for them, freedom is power over other people, right? And they don't feel free until they are enabled to um, sort of impose their will on other people. Same thing with the Texas abortion law, in fact, empowering people to harass doctors and uh, other people involved in reproductive choice. Michael, the president uh, is suing the state of uh, Texas on the abortion law. Good thing or bad thing? Yeah, I think, you know, they're going against the Constitution. They're trying to undo Roe versus Wade. Um, I think the same thing would be done if they tried to, you know, resegregate their schools. You know, they're going against uh, the, the Constitution. They're going against, um, you know, th these uh, court decisions that were made decades ago. And, you know, I think Texas and Florida and even Ohio are, are going to be a few of those that are going to face some uh, federal lawsuits um, due to these these laws that are trying to implement at the state and local levels. But we need more of it. We need suing when it comes to uh, voting rights, you know, trying to uh, purge uh, voters from, from the rolls. We need suing when it comes to um, going against uh, teaching critical race theory, which for people who don't know what that means, it's teaching racism, teaching about racism in school. They don't want people teaching about racism in, in school. And so that's a big problem. And so I hope there's more, even more lawsuits for that. So I applaud um, the state of Texas getting sued on, on this note. We got to have the comrades from Texas come on the show and explain what in the Sam hell is going on there. <laughs> because they got women, women's right to choose no. They're saying, uh, you want to teach uh, about racism? No. You want to have voting rights? No. There's a bunch of cowboys, billionaires who are just, they're going hog wild down there. We're going to have to. Well, I think part of this is the, oh, oh sorry. Go on. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I think uh, it's important to point out the hypocrisy that's going on, you know, because it, on the one hand, it's no to abortion, but and, and I saw this meme that said, if God's going to protect you from the virus, why do you need a gun to protect you? Right. And I think that really clearly points the hypocrisy of things. And, and hopefully, you know, some of those people can, can wake up to, to that reality. And I think, you know, it's, it's important for us to uh, help them wake up to that reality without you know, being aggressive or anything like that and trying, uh, but, you know, trying to help some of these people who they don't really think, they, they don't see the wrong in this. So how do we help them see that this is wrong? I think that's an important point because there's a history of fear, particularly in communities of color with respect mm -hmm. to how the medical establishment treats you, you know? And uh, people have been, um, you know, um, given uh, 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 sterilization, they've been sterilized without their consent, they're given sy syphilis, 
like in Tuskegee up until 1970, you know, without their consent, and who would consent to get to, they even tried to do that shit to me. When I was in college, I had a little problem. I went to see in your Raleigh. He said, let me sterilize you. <laughs> really? I said, wow. you better get out of here with hmm. that foolishness. Ain't nobody trying to get sterilized, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, and so there's that kind of, by the way, we have an article coming out probably today on, on mandates written by a medical student uh, in the Eastern Pennsylvania district. Uh, please pay, uh, uh, pay attention to it. You know, they got mandates for seat belts. Right. Got it's mandates for car insurance, you know? You need to have a mandate for wearing a helmet when you're riding a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. oh, people are crazy. That, that they're riding around, they're riding around going 100 miles an hour on a Harley. Ain't got head it. Ain't got, you know, uh, what you gonna call it? Uh, helmet to first. And they say this is my freedom. Mm -hmm. It's craziness. But the, the the mask thing is it goes I think even well beyond that. Because, um, you know, somebody rides a motorcycle without a helmet, they get in a crash, they're, they're brain damaged, whatever. Um, it's awful for them, awful for their family. Um, it doesn't sub place a substantial burden on the rest of society, whereas refusing to get vaccinated and refusing to wear a mask does. And I think that's where the sort of the political undertext of this kind of comes out, is that it, it's about minority rule. It's not just, it's not about their freedom, it's about the, the right of a minority to impose its priorities, its agenda, its will on the vast majority of people who have been trying to contain this pandemic, trying to control it, trying to deal with it. So it fits in with the whole Republican strategy, the attack on voting rights, uh, the uh, abortion law um, that takes the ability, it not only empowers you know, individuals to sue, it also takes the power for prosecuting what would be a crime if they you know, are under other circumstances, takes that power away from prosecutors, right? So um, it's, it's this whole, yeah, it's, it's, it's about securing and normalizing minority rule in every aspect of life, uh, which is 100% the ruling class model of society. Well, we'll see if Biden's numbers go up. They've been going down, down, down. The coronavirus and unemployment increasing. And and uh, now he's getting into a cold war with China. Oh. I saw that they had a meeting last, last yesterday. Xi Jinping and Biden had a meeting. Mm -hmm. And they're talking now. Rosanna, that's a good thing. Yes, it is a good thing. Yeah, I didn't. I hadn't heard that they were talking. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a that's a good thing. Talk is good, even though if it's maybe difficult or awkward. The talk is the best way to solve problems. Or but aren't they speaking out both sides of their mouth, Anita? On the one side, they're saying that uh, China is the new threat to democracy. We reached an inflection point. China is the major obstacle to world peace. China is suppressing the Uyghur minority. China this, China that. And then they want agreement on climate change and whatever else. Isn't that somehow uh, problematic? Right. It's the it's the uh, hypocrisy that, that Rosanna was talking about earlier in the other case as well, which is not only hypocrisy, but cynicism. I really don't, I mean, I don't think it's in the United States best interest to, to carry on in such a, a warmongering kind of way uh, to China right now. Uh, we should be cooperating on, on these big questions like climate change um, and, um, and labor rights for in, in the global economy. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, advancements that China has made that we should recognize and, and applaud and, uh, you know, look, you know, give them the props that they deserve for those, uh, for those changes and move forward as cooperating instead of, instead of fighting. 
And, and, and uh, that anti-Chinese rhetoric on the national level affects the way people interact on the street as well. It, it raises um, you know, anti-Asian uh, 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 and Pacific Islander uh, violence is, uh, is on the rise. Uh, because of that rhetoric, and I think I think we really ought to try to stem that. Um, and our um, I know our party has a commitment to peace and um, and uh, peaceful world, and uh, not following what the uh, um, war machines, the military-industrial complex, really has in mind for us. So I think we have to be really on the lookout, not to switch from a cold war uh, to uh, or from a war on terror to a war on China. So Michael, what's going on here? You got this really progressive domestic program, infrastructure, voting rights, environmental regulation, not Green New Deal, but it's you know, moving in that direction. Family Act. Um, some people say, oh, he's like LBJ. Oh, he, he, he may even be like FDR. But then, you got this very strong Cold War push. Uh, isn't that like contradictory or do they complement each other in your opinion? Well, I think we have to, I think it is um, correct to kind of compare him to FDR and LBJ in certain aspects, but why were FDR and LGB, uh, LBJ known for these progressive policies? It's because the people pushed for them. You know, FDR, uh, despite, you know, really getting us out of the, uh, the uh, Great Depression, you know, with the, the World War had a great uh, impact on that as, as well. But um, he also made mistakes domestically, you know, he sent Japanese Americans to internment camps. LG, LBJ, you know, was known for civil rights, but, he, you know, he was the one that started uh, the war in Vietnam. And so um, well, he I didn't don't, start it. He kind of continued. He, he continued it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, it really started it. towards the end of the Eisenhower years. That's correct. And so um, I think that's a big mistake that we have to that we have to we have to be almost self critical as being involved in in the, in the people movements, the social movements, because we're calling for all these great things domestically. But how can we get people to realize that you can't have these progressive domestic policies and then aggressive foreign policies? You know, how can we push for stronger progressive policies here at home, but also for uh, better progressive policies abroad. Do we learn nothing from Afghanistan? Do we learn nothing from the last Cold War, you know? And so, um, you know, getting involved in, in, a, in, a, in a Cold War or even a hot war in certain cases, uh, you know, with China, Russia, um, and then, you know, and continuing the aggressive policy towards Cuba after Biden had promised to go back to the Obama era administration's um, uh, policy, you know, it's just unacceptable. And so I, I, it doesn't do anything good for American people. I think I agree with Anita that we should be cooperating with um, governments that we don't quote unquote agree with. You know, the United States government doesn't agree with on issues such as climate change and on issues such as, you know, human rights and, and so forth. And so I think that, um, I think it's, it's a wise comparison to compare them to LG, LBJ and uh, FDR, but what were the mistakes that those administrations made and how can we avoid those mistakes going forward? God, you were so excited when Biden got pre elected president. Your Uncle Joe, the neighbor. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's my, he's my homeboy. Yeah, I, I forgot that. I mean, what's your assessment of him now? I mean, is it is it is he going to be emerge as a progressive statesman or a feckless cold warrior? I, uh, How do I, you assess it? I don't think he's going to emerge. Um, I, I think that the, the game that he's playing or the strategy that he's pursuing or, or whatever you want to call it um, is very much one of, you know, uh, of attempting to, to reconcile two sides, searching for this middle path of, you know, reaching across the aisle and, you know, trying to cement a kind of centrist, moderate sort of program that includes, um, you know, a scale of a scaled back version of his progressive promises to the people, uh, and also, you know, concessions to the the neoconservative uh, kind of side, and really trying to. Um, I, I think he's he's nostalgic for, like many people, for this Cold War kind of mentality, where where you have this this anti-communist glue binding together, you know, or a 
giving the illusion of binding together American society. I, I think he's going to keep doing that because in terms of these great progressive domestic programs, there's been a lot of talk, but somehow when it comes down to it, it's always, you know, at the last minute, oh, you know, we're, we're cutting the taxing the rich out of the infrastructure bill. Oh, well, we, we, we have to appease this one or that one on the minimum wage, right? And yeah, those, it's true, there's, op there's opposition, but I haven't seen much evidence that he's willing to go up against Republicans in Congress um, to really push for um, uh, uh, the ability to, to keep some of the promises that his campaign uh, made. And on China, yeah, I, I agree with Michael. There's, it's not in the end, and Anita, it's not in the interest of the, the people of the United States to pursue a war with China. Um, it's, you know, it's in the interest of Wall Street, which wants to maintain its long time position. Their vision of the world is Wall Street should own the rights to all the technology, all the innovations. We're the economy of innovation, right? That means they control the intellectual property and other nations provide the cheap labor um, to, uh, to generate profits from their intellectual property. And that's another important part of this China thing. Um, they are absolutely terrified um, of having, of being eclipsed uh, technologically, um, of having their, their intellectual property be, you know, become worthless. Uh, and and that's why they're pushing so hard. So you say he's not going to emerge, which means that the democratic platform, the progressive platform, the hopes of millions are going to be dashed and the Republicans are going to win the midterms and the next election and Trump is going to be the new president, Rosanna. You think Scott's right? <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not when you lay it out that way. <clears throat> I don't think so. I think that, you know, once again, it's the people who are going to have to have to push for this. We're going to have to get back on the street or some find other forms to to really push for a diplomatic relationship. Uh, I don't see, I you know, I one of the questions I'm asking myself is how dependent is the US on China? And can you really begin a Cold War when you're doing so much, you have so many um, relations, you know, so many uh, exchanges with China in terms of material, you know, things like that. Um, so I, I'm, I mean, I don't have, I don't know exactly, I haven't done a study on exactly what, you know, what the relationship is, <clears throat> but I have heard that some companies are pushing um, Biden not to be so aggressive because of their interest, you know, mm -hmm. there. So that kind of prompts me to think, well, maybe that's why he's talking to President Xi. So we'll see, we'll, we'll see it, but I think we have to stay vigilant. And and continue to push for for a good foreign policy. It's true, and and there is pushback. Bernie Sanders wrote a letter, article saying no, forty organizations, peace and concerned union of scientists, environmental group said no, don't do this. Some members of Congress, Barbara Lee. And the Ilhan Omar and Ro, what's the name from uh, Washington State? Uh, no, nobody, no. Mm -hmm. The Communist Party has to say, no, Biden, no. I'm going down that path with you. Was it a mistake to support him? We didn't endorse him. Some of y'all, some of y'all wanted to. I know what? people who grew up next to him. They were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was 100. You, you remember I have my Biden T-shirts and my. Oh no. <laughs> I mean, they they might have said you know fuck Biden on him at some point. <laughs> no, that, that that's that's a joke. Right? It's a it's a mixed bag, <laughs> and there are divisions in the administration. There are divisions. Some of the people are saying no, don't do this, in the State Department and other places. I'm reading. But uh, so there's room for struggle 
But that means we got to rebuild the peace movement. That means we got to rebuild the movement to end the blockade against Cuba. Because Michael's right. They said they were going to reset relations. Mm -hmm. Well, they reset them backwards because of those demonstrations that developed. Uh, and also they're looking at the Florida, uh, you know, election next right. year and to the House and they want to try to court part of the uh, vote, you know, Cuban mainly, but also Puerto Rican and white and black. And so it's, you know, so there's a lot of opportunisms going on there. And, mm -hmm. uh, but we got a really mixed situation taking place in this country and, and uh, in a mixed situation, it means you got to bring even more pressure to bear and, and fight like, you know, nobody's business. And that's one of the things that the party has to think about doing is how to rebuild and how to restart and re-energize these kinds of movements. Well, I think that does it better for today. We had a lot of other subjects that we wanted to talk about, but we are out of time. Mm -hmm. Michael, we got any programs coming up? Not until next weekend. Uh, we have on the 17th, which is Friday, we have an abolition writing uh, workshop, which you can um, register to attend on cpusa.org. And then on the 19th, two days later, which is Sunday, we have an organizing uh, training, you know, how to organize people in your neighborhood, how to organize people on campus, how to organize a CPUSA yeah. or YCL club. And so check those out. You can, again, you can register to attend on cpusa.org. And then there, uh, there will be a class on China, I believe, the following Sunday, the 26th. Yeah, the 26th. 26th. Great. All right. Well, until then, we want you to uh, stay safe, stay strong, and stay in the fight. We'll see everybody next week. And wear your mask and get yes. the goddamn vaccination. <laughs> Stop all this craziness. You're going to infect yourself, your family, your neighbors. You know, it spreads like wildfire, this Delta variant. I'm sorry, I had to get that in, Michael. I said you had the last word. Good morning, revolution, y'all.